Hi, Rachel here with the Charlotte Mason Plenary. We're so glad you found the audiobook of Volume 6, Charlotte's Last Volume, A Philosophy of Education. It is by far, in my opinion, the best and most transformative volume, so you're definitely in the right place. Now, we at a Charlotte Mason Plenary are offering this audio to you perfectly free because we think everybody should be reading Charlotte's words. However, we do offer an annotated edition in both print and in the audiobook version. So, the best of both worlds, in my opinion, is the audiobook, whether it has annotations or not, and the annotated editions. Because in the annotated editions, you get all of these wonderful side notes in the margins that explain what Charlotte's talking about, as well as give you definitions and stuff to all that uh, Victorian English. So, best of both worlds, audiobook and annotated edition. Please visit us over at a Charlotte Mason Plenary at cmplenary.com, and I hope you enjoy the audiobook. Chapter 8 The Way of the Will we may offer to children two guides to moral and intellectual self-management, which we may call the way of the will and the way of the reason. The way of the will. Children should be taught a. to distinguish between I want and I will, b. that the way to will effectively is to turn our thoughts away from that which we desire but do not will, c that the best way to turn our thoughts is to think of or do some quite different thing, entertaining or interesting, and d, that after a little rest in this way, the will returns to its work with new vigor. This adjunct of the will is familiar to us as diversion, whose office it is to take ease for a time from will effort, that we may will again with added power. The use of suggestion as an aid to the will is to be deprecated, as tending to stultify and stereotype character. It would seem that spontaneity is a condition of development, and that human nature needs the discipline of failure as well as of success. The great things of life, life itself, are not easy of definition. The will, we are told, is the sole practical faculty of man. But who is to define the will? We are told again that the will is the man, and yet most men go through life without a single definite act of willing. Habit, convention, the customs of the world have done so much for us that we get up, dress, breakfast, follow our morning's occupations, our later relaxations, without an act of choice. For this much, at any rate, we know about the will. Its function is to choose, to decide, and there seems to be no doubt that the greater becomes the effort of decision, the weaker grows the general will. Opinions are provided for us. We take our principles at second or third hand. Our habits are suitable and convenient, and what more is necessary for a decent and orderly life? But the one achievement possible and necessary for every man is character and character is as finely wrought metal beaten into shape and beauty by the repeated and accustomed action of the will. We who teach should make it clear to ourselves that our aim in education is less conduct than character. Conduct may be arrived at, as we have seen, by indirect routes, but it is of value to the world only as it has its source in character. Every assault upon the flesh and spirit of man is an attack, however insidious, upon his personality, his will. But a new Armageddon is upon us, in so far as that the attack is no longer indirect, but is aimed consciously and directly at the will, which is the man. And we shall escape becoming a nation of imbeciles only because there will always be persons of good will amongst us who will resist the general trend. The office of parents and teachers is to turn out such persons of good will, that they should deliberately weaken the moral fiber of their children by suggestion is a very grave offense, and a thoughtful examination of the subject should act as a sufficient deterrent. For, let us consider, what we do with the will we describe as voluntary. What we do without the conscious action of will is involuntary.
The will has only one mode of action. Its function is to choose. And with every choice we make, we grow in force of character. From the cradle to the grave, suggestions crowd upon us, and such suggestions become part of our education because we must choose between them. But a suggestion given by intent and supported by an outside personality has an added strength which few are able to resist, just because the choice has been made by another and not by ourselves. And our tendency is to accept this vicarious choice and follow the path of least resistance. No doubt much of this vicarious choosing is done for our good, whether for our health of body or amenableness of mind. But those who propose suggestion as a means of education do not consider that with every such attempt upon a child they weaken that which should make a man of him, his own power of choice. The parasitic creatures who live upon the habits, principles, and opinions of others may easily become criminal. They only wait the occasion of some popular outburst to be carried into such a fury of crime as the Gordon riots presented, a mad fury of which we have had terrible examples in our own day. Though we have failed to ascribe them to their proper cause, the undermining of the will of the people who have not been instructed in that ordering of the will which is their chief function as men and women. His will is the safeguard of a man against the unlawful intrusion of other persons. We are taught that there are offenses against the bodies of others which may not be committed, but who teaches us that we may not intrude upon the minds and overrule the wills of others, that it is indecent to let another probe the thoughts of the unconscious mind, whether of child or man? Now the thought that we choose is commonly the thought that we ought to think, and the part of the teacher is to afford to each child a full reservoir of the right thought of the world to draw from. For right thinking is by no means a matter of self-expression. Right thought flows upon the stimulus of an idea, and ideas are stored as we have seen in books and pictures and the lives of men and nations. These instruct the conscience and stimulate the will and a man or child chooses. An accomplished statesman exhibited to us lately how the disintegration of a great empire was brought about by the weakness of its rulers, who allowed their willpower to be tampered with, their judgment suggested, their actions directed, by those who gained access to them. There is no occasion for panic, but it is time that we realize that to fortify the will is one of the great purposes of education, and probably some study of the map of the city of Mansoul would afford us guidance. At least a bird's eye view of the riches of the city should be spread before children. They should themselves know of the wonderful capacities to enter upon the world as a great inheritance which exists in every human being. All its beauty and all its thought are open to everyone. Everyone may take service for the world's use. Everyone may climb those delectable mountains from whence he gets the vision of the city of God. He must know something of his body with its senses and its appetites, of his intellect, imagination, and aesthetic sense, of his moral nature ordered by love and justice. Realizing how much is possible to man's soul and the perils that assail it, he should know that the duty of self-direction belongs to him, and that powers for this direction are lodged in him, as are intellect and imagination, hunger and thirst. These governing powers are the conscience and the will, the whole ordering of education with its history, poetry, arithmetic, pictures, is based on the assumption that conscience is incapable of ordering life without regular and progressive instruction. We need instruction also concerning the will. Persons commonly suppose that the action of the will is automatic, but no power of man's soul acts by itself and of itself, and some little study of the way of the will which has the ordering of every other power, may help us to understand the functions of this premier in the kingdom of Mansoul. Early in his teens, we should at least put clearly before a child the possibility of a drifting, easy life led by appetite or desire, in which will plays no part. 
and the other possibility of using the power and responsibility proper to him as a person and willing as he goes. He must be safeguarded from some fallacies. No doubt he has heard at home that baby has a strong will because he cries for a knife and insists on pulling down the tablecloth. In his history lessons and his readings of tale and poem, he comes across persons each of whom carries his point by strong willfulness. He laughs at that rash boy Phaeton, measures Esau with a considering eye, finds him more attractive than Jacob who yet wins higher approval, perceives that Esau is willful but that Jacob has a strong will, and through this and many other examples recognizes that a strong will is not synonymous with being good, nor with a determination to have your own way. He learns to distribute the characters he comes across in his reading on either side of a line, those who are willful and those who are governed by will. And this line by no means separates between the bad and the good. It does divide, however, between the impulsive, self-pleasing, self-seeking, and the persons who have an aim beyond and outside of themselves, even though it be an aim appalling as that of Milton Satan. It follows for him that he must not only will, but will with a view to an object outside himself. He will learn to recognize in Louis XI a mean man and a great king, because France and not himself was the object of his crooked policy. The will, too, is of slow growth, nourished upon the ideas proposed to it, and so all things work together for good to the child who is duly educated. It is well that children should know that while the turbulent person is not ruled by will at all but by impulse, the movement of his passions or desires, yet it is possible to have a constant will with unworthy or evil ends, or even to have a steady will towards a good end and to compass that end by unworthy means. The simple rectified will, what our Lord calls the single eye, would appear to be the one thing needful for straight living and serviceableness. But always the first condition of will, good or ill, is an object outside of self. The boy or girl who sees this will understand that self-culture is not to be accepted as an ideal, will not wonder why Bushido is mighty in Japan, will enter into the problem which Browning raises in the statue and the bust. By degrees, the scholar will perceive that just as to reign is the distinctive function of a king, so to will is the function of a man. A king is not a king unless he reigns, and a man is less than a man unless he wills. Another thing to be observed is that even the constant will has its times of rise and fall, and one of the secrets of living is how to tide over the times of fall in willpower. The boy must learn, too, that the will is subject to solicitations all round, from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, that will does not act alone. It takes the whole man to will, and a man wills wisely, justly, and strongly, in proportion as all his powers are in training and under instruction. We must understand in order to will. How is that ye will not understand? said our Lord to the Jews. And that is the way with most of us. We will not understand. We look out for great occasions which do not come and do not see that the sphere for the action of our wills is in ourselves. Our concern with life is to be fit, and according to our fitness come our occasions and the uses we shall be put to. Unlike every other power in the kingdom of man's soul, the will is able to do what it likes, is a free agent, and the one thing the will has to do is to prefer. Choose ye this day is the command that comes to each of us in every affair and on every day of our lives, and the business of the will is to choose. But choice, the effort of decision, is a heavy labor, whether it be between two lovers or two gowns. So many people minimize this labor by following the fashion in their clothes, rooms, reading, amusements, the pictures they admire, and the friends they select. We are zealous in choosing for others, but shirk the responsibility of decisions for ourselves. What is to be said about obedience? 
to the heads of the house first, to the state, to the church, and always to the laws of God. Obedience is the test, the sustainer of personality, but it must be the obedience of choice. Because choice is laborious, little children must be trained in the obedience of habit, but every gallant boy and girl has learned to choose to obey all who are set in authority. Such obedience is of the essence of chivalry, and chivalry is that temper of mind opposed to self-seeking. The chivalrous person is a person of constant will, for as we have seen, will cannot be exercised steadily for ends of personal gain. It is well to know what it is we choose between. Things are only signs which represent ideas, and several times a day we shall find two ideas presented to our minds and must make our choice upon right and reasonable grounds. We shall thus be on our guard against the weak allowance which we cause to do duty for choice and against such dishonest fallacies as that it is our business to get the best that is to be had at the lowest price, and it is not only in matters of dress and ornament, household use and decoration, that we run after the cheapest and newest. We chase opinions and ideas with the same restlessness and uncertainty. Any fad, any notion in the newspapers we pick up with eagerness. Once again, the will is the man. The business of the will is to choose. There are many ways to get out of the task of choosing, but it is always choose you this day whom ye will serve. There are two services open to us all, the service of God, including that of man, and the service of self. If our aim is just to get on, to do ourselves well, to get all possible ease, luxury, and pleasure out of our lives, we are serving self, and for the service of self no act of will is required. Our appetites and desires are always at hand to spur us into the necessary exertions. But if we serve God and our neighbor, we have to be always on the watch to choose between the ideas that present themselves. What the spring is to the year, school days are to our life. You meet a man whose business in the world appears to be to eat and drink, play golf and motor. He may have another and deeper life that we know nothing about, but, so far as we can see, he has enlisted in the service of self. You meet another, a man of position, doing important work, and his ideas are those he received from the great men who taught him at school and college. The Greek plays are his hobby. He is open to great thoughts and ready for service, because that which we get in our youth we keep through our lives. Though the will affects all our actions and all our thoughts, its direct action is confined to a very little place, to that postern at either side of which stand conscience and reason, and at which ideas must needs present themselves. Shall we take an idea in or reject it? Conscience and reason have their say, but will is supreme, and the behavior of will is determined by all the principles we have gathered, all the opinions we have formed. We accept the notion, ponder it. At first we vaguely intend to act upon it. Then we form a definite purpose, then a resolution, and then comes an act or general temper of mind. We are told of Rudyard Kipling that his great ambition and desire at one time was to keep a tobacconist shop. Why? Because in this way he could get into human touch with the men who came to buy their weekly allowance of tobacco. Happily for the world, he did not become a tobacconist, but the idea which moved him in the first place has acted throughout his life. Always he has men, young men, about him, and who knows how many he has moved to become captains courageous by his talk as well as by his books. But suppose an unworthy idea present itself at the postern, supported by public opinion, by reason for which even conscience finds pleas. The will soon wearies of opposition, and what is to be done? Fight it out? That is what the medieval church did with those ideas which it rightly regarded as temptations. The lash, the hair shirt, the stone couch, the emaciated frame told us of these not too successful Armageddons. When the overstrained will asks for repose, it may not relax to yielding point, but may and must seek recreation, diversion. 
Latin thought has afforded us beautiful and appropriate names for that which we require. A change of physical or mental occupation is very good, but if no other change is convenient, let us think of something else, no matter how trifling. A new tie or our next new hat, a storybook we are reading, a friend we hope to see, anything does so long as we do not suggest to ourselves the thoughts we ought to think on the subject in question. The will does not want the support of arguments, but the recreation of rest, change, diversion. In a surprisingly short time, it is able to return to the charge and to choose this day the path of duty, however dull or tiresome, difficult or dangerous. This way of the will is a secret of power, the secret of self-government, with which people should be furnished, not only for ease and practical right-doing, or for the advance in the religious life, but also for their intellectual well-being. Our claim to free will is a righteous claim. Will can only be free, whether its object be right or wrong. It is a matter of choice, and there is no choice but free choice. But we are apt to translate free will into free thought. We allow ourselves to sanction intellectual anarchism and forget that it rests with the will to order the thoughts of the mind fully as much as the feelings of the heart or the lusts of the flesh. Our thoughts are not our own, and we are not free to think as we choose. The injunction, Choose ye this day, applies to the thoughts which we allow ourselves to receive. Will is the one free agent of man's soul. Will alone may accept or reject. And will is therefore responsible for every intellectual problem which has proved too much for a man's sanity or for his moral probity. We may not think what we please on shallow matters or profound. The instructed conscience and trained reason support the will in those things, little and great, by which men live. The ordering of the will is not an affair of sudden resolve. It is the outcome of a slow and ordered education in which precept and example flow in from the lives and thoughts of other men, men of antiquity and men of the hour, as unconsciously and spontaneously as the air we breathe. But the moment of choice is immediate and the act of will voluntary, and the object of education is to prepare us for this immediate choice and voluntary action which every day presents. While affording some secrets of the way of the will to young people, we should perhaps beware of presenting the ideas of self-knowledge, self-reverence, and self-control. All adequate education must be outward bound, and the mind which is concentrated upon self-emolument, even though it be the emolument of all the virtues, misses the higher and the simpler secrets of life. Duty and service are the sufficient motives for the arduous training of the will that a child goes through with little consciousness. The gradual fortifying of the will, which many a schoolboy undergoes, is hardly perceptible to himself, however tremendous the result may be for his city or his nation. Will, free will, must have an object outside of self, and the poet has said the last word so far as yet we know. Our wills are ours we know not how, our wills are ours to make them thine. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of Charlotte Mason's Volume 6. And of course, if you need help, there's always the annotated edition, or you can come find us and ask questions. We'd love to help you. You can find us at cmplenary.com or over in our Facebook group. Look forward to chatting with you.